Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first meeting of the new year for the Denbydale Amateur Radio Club in our series of meetings with speakers. And I'm delighted to uh, have tonight uh, Rob Sherwood, uh, November Charlie Zero Bravo from Colorado. Uh, Rob is known to radio amateurs across the world for an amazing series of reports that he has produced over many years. I can't remember how many years it is, Rob. You'll tell us, I'm sure, about 30 years, I think, um, on, uh, on radio performance uh, that are poured over by many people before they go, <laughs> go down and invest their thousands of pounds or dollars in a new radio. Uh, so looking forward very much to, uh, to Rob's talk tonight. And as I said uh, before we f properly started the meeting, uh, we've got our next speaker in two weeks' time is Frank Howell, K4FMH, and Frank's going to follow up Rob's talk just to have a look at probably the question that every radio amateur wants to look at, um, and that is, you know, really, what do we get for our money, and what are the alternatives there, and, and what are we buying uh, for our cash in terms of performance um, and, and the way the radio actually works. And I, I think I made the point before Christmas when I said that our next speaker in the new year was going to be Rob Sherwood, that we've managed to have nine months worth of meetings without having a single meeting dedicated to talking about a radio. And given that that's our hobby <laughs> and our hobby is playing with radios and uh, using them for whatever mode people want to use them for, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? We've managed to go all that time. So uh, it couldn't be better really than to uh, uh, to start the meeting with Rob. So Rob, I'm going to hand the microphone over to you and um, put you in control of it. Uh, if you unmute yourself and uh, I'll let you fire away. Okay, let me um, sh share the screen here and maximize it. So anyway, good evening everyone. Let me slide this guy over here, get it out of the way. So, well, let's go to the home page. I don't know what. It's. So, I'm going to be talking about transceivers, not only receiver performance, but transmitter performance, because today we've got so many fine receivers, and sometimes it's the other guy's transmitter. That's the limitation. So, let's look about this. So, we don't want to just focus on a few transceivers, because we have lots of choices. And uh, here's when I started testing radios, 1976. So uh, being 73 years old, I guess that's possible. So we have lots of choices today, some new challenges. So let's see what they are. I get requests on email and uh, talking to friends and they say, well, why is your chart sorted by close in dynamic range? Why don't you sort it by sensitivity as though that was an issue and it's not an issue. So Let's look at some sensitivity measurements for back in time, 1954, the R390A. I don't know if they showed up much in Europe, but they certainly were popular here in the US after uh, the war. 0.2 microvolts, the Drake R4C that I'm known for making lots of upgrade kits, 0.2 microvolts, and a K3S. I'm sure you know what that is with preamp number one on 0.2 microvolts. So we really don't have sensitivity issues. And in an urban environment, the RFI noise is often the limit. So what is sensitivity and what is noise floor? And that's a newer term. So sensitivity generally measured in a sideband bandwidth for a 10 dB signal plus noise to noise ratio. And I listed in microvolts because then you can go compare it to your Drake 2B or whatever radio you've got that goes back in time. And to measure that, you feed in a signal generator, and then you adjust the level so that when the signal's out of the passband and then back in the passband, the audio changes 10 dB. That's the definition. Noise floor, which came out as a term in 1975, that means that you tune the signal in versus out of the passband, and the signal goes up 3 dB on your audio meter. That also means that the signal equals the noise floor because the two signals add up that way with that 3 dB difference. So, and we look at those radios I just mentioned, the noise floors are virtually identical. So it's a uh, noise floor hasn't been an issue either. 
Well, what is the issue today is noise has gone up. When I moved to Denver in 1969, it was pretty quiet. And we've got line noise, which seems like it's worse. All the things that we charge up, like our smartphones, they're now switching power supplies. And of course, the computers all have switching power supplies. And household appliances have microprocessors, your dishwasher, your washing machine, your refrigerator. That can make racket. Sometimes LEDs make noise. Our uh, broadband source, if it's a DSL type of circuit, and luckily or not, in Colorado and other states, we've got grow lights to grow pots. So that makes awful noise. So what other big number do we need to worry about? Well, dynamic range. And we'll talk about the magic 100 dB radio. Even though we probably don't need the 100 dB radio, it's not uncommon today. If you go back 20 years ago, you couldn't buy one. Now, you above six meters, that's a different story when we get on two meters and 70 centimeters. But for the HF and six meter guy, we got lots of choices for really fine receivers. So what is dynamic range? And that means we want to work the weakest guy. It's going to be DXCC number 100 or WAS in the US or whatever it is. Uh, but we've got tons of signals nearby that are really strong. And we don't want those strong signals to be causing interference in our radio. And for the longest time in QST, the once this dynamic range was defined and noise floor was defined, the radios, when tested in that manner, didn't really test anything but the front end. And I'll explain that with another slide down the way. So what we called up conversion radios that we had for maybe 20 or 25 years, they're kind of gone as far as new products, except for the 7851, which is kind of pricey. So um, I doubt there'll be any more up conversion designs, but who knows? So here's what we're going to talk about today. Close in dynamic range, which is particularly important for CW and RIDI, whether it's DXing, contesting, or DXpeditions or whatever. Less so on sideband, and I'll explain why that is. Noise floor, well, we need it, even though all the radios are adequate, but we need that noise floor value to calculate the dynamic, dynamic range. Reciprocal mixing dynamic range, that's a fairly new term from 2012 that the league came up with, and that talks about phase noise of your radio. Because we're no longer using crystals for the bands in a PTO like a Drake or a Collins, we're all uh, synthesized today. Transmitted broadband composite noise, composite meaning AM noise and phase noise, total noise, that can be a problem in a local environment. Well, we all know what splatter is on sideband, of course. We've certainly run into that in key click. So those are all the type of things we're going to talk about today. So in 1975, both QST and Ham Radio Magazine define what noise floor was in dynamic range. And what was done was they fed in two equally strong signals, adjusted those two signals so that the distortion created in the radio created a product at the noise floor. So that was the definition of dynamic range. So just as an example, if we had a noise floor of minus 128 dBm, and it took two signals, minus 28 dBm, to cause distortion created in the radio, the third order product, to be equal to that noise floor for that 3 dB increase as we tuned in the distortion product. That would be our 100 dB radio, because the difference between those two levels, minus 128 and 28 is 100. Or, of course, whatever it is, 83, 69, whatever it is. So here's what the issue was for a long, long time, 20 or 25 years, when we only had up conversion radios, because all the old style radios with a pre-selector in the band crystal and the PTO, those went away. And so when the testing was at 20 kilohertz apart, which is what happened with in 1975, well, those two signals were pretty far down the band or up the band. So let's just say the two signals are 20 kilohertz away and 40 kilohertz away to put the distortion product in the pass band. Well, if we've got a 15 KC roofing filter, which is what we had for those up conversion radios, 
those two signals are not getting past the roofing filter. So you're testing the first mixer, the preamp if it's on, maybe any passive intermodulation in the roofing filter, but that's it. So since I ran into a case where my radio, which happened to be a Drake, well, it tested okay with this 20 KC method, but it fell apart in a 160 meter CW contest. So what I did back there in the late seventies was say, okay, let's put in two test signals, two kilohertz apart, that'll get through the roofing filter. And then suddenly these numbers that were being published went from the nineties to the seventies or even lower. So that was where I started testing. And the reason I did it was simply because my radio tested okay, but fell apart on the air. Well, since we all now have synthesized radios one way or another, when they first came out, they were pretty terrible. We got rid of the drift. We had digital readout. We probably had general coverage, but we had noisy synthesizers. So here's a little graphic I found on the web that sort of explains what reciprocal mixing or the effect of the noisy synthesizer, because that may not be obvious because our synthesizer isn't clean, so what? So let's look at that little bullet nose signal on the left, and that's the weak guy we're trying to copy. And let's say there's a really strong signal nearby, and to make it a perfect signal, that doesn't exist, but even if it was a perfect signal, it doesn't matter because the noise on the local oscillator mixes in the radio with the strong signal that's nearby and it puts the noise sidebands of the local oscillator on top of the strong signal. So if we look over to there to the right, you can see that the sidebands of the uh, strong signal now, the noise sidebands can be on top of the weak signal. Now this graphic assumes that the noise from the local oscillator will fall off fairly quickly. That may be the case and it may not. There are some radios where the noise spectra of the local oscillator, the synthesized local oscillator is fairly flat. So it may be poor at 10 kilohertz. It may be equally bad at 100 kilohertz or 300 kilohertz. So if we're even if we're spread out and you've got some radios that have this really flat and poor noisy oscillator, it can cause havoc all over the band. So the devil's really in the details. If we're looking at reviews in QST, for instance, or RSGB, the re uh, reciprocal mixing dynamic range was explained by Bob Allison of QST in April 2012 and May of 2016. So if you'd like more detail, and you can get a PDF of this uh, presentation. You can look those issues up if you're a league member and uh, see what that's all about in more detail. But often, matter of fact, for that entire time that we had the up conversion radios, almost all the radios, their limit generally wasn't the third order dynamic range, at least close in. It was usually the phase noise of the radio. So here is a prime example of where it wasn't obvious what was going on. I actually tested an FTDX 3000 and published the data on my website before this product review in QST. And I said the dynamic range was 82 dB, but I had a footnote that said it was phase noise limited. And then the review came out and they said the dynamic range, the third order dynamic range was 100 dB. And I think a, a Yezu ad even said it was 106. I don't know where that came from. But if you read the fine print, which wasn't very obvious there in 2013, the reciprocal mixing dynamic range was 82 dB, exactly the same number that I published on my website. In order to get that funny 100 dB number, what the league did was use a audio spectrum analyzer with a very narrow bandwidth of a few hertz, maybe 10 hertz, three hertz, one hertz, I don't know which value they picked. In order to measure this third order product, which by definition is the dynamic range, but it was so covered up by noise that they had to eliminate the noise to make the measurement. So that's just kind of crazy. You know, if you have a 
dynamic range measurement made some funny way that says it's 100. And the really the reciprocal mixing dynamic range is 82. Guess what? 82 is what's going to dominate. Well, that was a while ago. And the radios have gotten so much better lately that it, that hasn't come up much. Well, it came up in March of 2020 with this QRP rig out of China, the G90, the Zygu, I believe it's the right pronunciation. The same thing happened again. Now, it wasn't quite as glaring as with the FTDX 3000, but the dynamic range, they said, was 91, which was measured with a very narrow filter on the spectrum analyzer. But the reciprocal mixing dynamic range, the phase noise, limited to 84. So again, 84 is the number, the bigger number, forget it. The other interesting thing is read Bob's sidebars. Every time Bob Allison makes a measurement and publishes a review, and he just does the technical side, and, you know, someone else does the hands-on stuff. Well, if there's something strange, he'll make a sidebar. So he pointed out on this Zygu G90, he said he had mediocre CW keying sidebands, key clicks. The IMD splatter wasn't very good. And the transmit phase noise, broadband noise, wasn't good either, such that he said, don't use it with an amplifier, or you're going to cause a lot of havoc with the guys on the band. So that's not exactly a glowing report. So we need to be good neighbors and not put out wide signals, clicky signals, splattering signals, because we've got to all share the bands. The other funny thing with the Zygu G90 was blocking, of course, is a measurement that makes sense. It's in my table. It shows up in QST and, and probably RSGB. For a super hit, that simply means the point where the radio starts to be in saturation. With a direct sampling radio, it's different. It's the uh, ADC overload point. But so they measure the dynamic range, the blocking dynamic range at 121. That's not a tremendously good number, but it's not terrible. But again, they had to measure it with a very narrow spectrum analyzer audio measurement. Well, the reciprocal mixing dynamic range at five kilohertz was 84. But then they said the blocking was 121, but it was covered up with phase noise. So again, that was a 37 dB difference. And just ignore the 121 number, because again, the radio is, is going to be falling apart at the 84 dB point. So we just have to really pay attention to the reviews so that we know where, what the radio really performs like. So as I said earlier, the phase noise, the reciprocal mixing dynamic range often dominates. And um, there are a few legacy radios, meaning superhet, whether it's a regular superhet or the newer hybrids, that it perform very well and the phase noise is not an issue. And that would be the K3S, which has the new synthesizer. If you had a K3 and didn't upgrade your synthesizer, it wouldn't be quite as good. Hopefully, they are, Elecraft will still offer that upgrade, but right now they're focused on getting the K4 out the door. The 7851, well, you'd hope so for $12,000. Don't know what it costs in pounds, but it's a lot. But then the new hybrids, the FTDX 101D and the TS890S from Kenwood, um, very clean synthesizers. It's taken years, decades, so that we really have synthesized radios that don't have the problems that we had for the first 20 or 25 years. The direct sampling radios. Now, if you have a direct sampling radio, it has a clock. It doesn't have a local oscillator like the Super Het, but it has to have a clock, a crystal oscillator to keep things uh, timed. And if you put in a decent clock oscillator, you don't have a phase noise problem. So the ICOM, all the Flex, the Apaches, those are the main ones. And so they don't have phase noise problems either. So we're already a third through. Um, do we have any questions and uh, comments or whatever? Nick? OK, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Rob. Right, who's got uh, a question to, to Rob at this stage on, uh, uh, on his introduction there? Can't hang on a second. I'm just trying to get the um, 
I've just got one question. Okay, yeah, one as well. Well. okay take Russell first, and then was yeah. it you, Ken? Yeah, yeah, Russell, yeah. Um, go on, far away. Uh, sorry, um, you, you may be going to cover this, Rob, but uh, you, you've suggested that uh, reciprocal noise is not the limiting factor of the direct sampling radios, but I guess something else is. Yes, yeah, so, so an ADC chip has a limitation. So, of course, the chip is never quiet enough to be used without a preamp. So it's going to have a driver, a driver chip that's typically 20 dB gain, and then also maybe a preamp too. So at some point, depending on how much gain is ahead of the ADC chip, maybe just the driver chip, but maybe a preamp plus the driver chip, it'll overrange the ADC. So when, uh, when we look at the column in my website that says blocking, if it's a super hit, that's real blocking. Either it means that we're in compression and that would be classic blocking or the phase noise is the limitation. So instead of the signal getting weaker, the phase noise went up. Or if it's the ADC type radio, direct sampling radio, then the chip just goes into overload and the radio goes crazy. Okay, thank you. I understand that. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, Russell. Ken, uh, BZV. Yeah. Um, uh, good evening, Rob. Um, a question about the Zygu that you mentioned, the Chinese radio. Uh, it's a very low cost radio compared to um, things like the TS-890, or is it, yeah, the 890 and the 101 from Yesu, which are many thousands of pounds, and the ICOM 7851, the Zygu, three or four hundred dollars maybe in American money to buy one of those but how are they compensating because when I listen on the YouTube videos to the quality of the received audio they actually don't seem bad for the very 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 low cost of a radio three or four hundred dollars are they using some sort of well are they using good filtering on them to make uh, to deal with this uh, uh, mixing this the, to get this dynamic range, or is it just that poor you wouldn't touch one? Well, uh, by the way, I am going to borrow one from another guy, and so I'll get it on my website probably in the next 30 to 60 days, but it was reviewed in QST, obviously. Mm. Well, here's the reason that we can get away with less than ideal, because when we had those up-conversion radios, and maybe the last one I owned of the classic up-conversion radio was the ICOM Pro 3, and the Pro 3 um, had a, about a low 70s dynamic range, but that's what we had and we used them, and I'll explain in a bit why on sideband, something else is usually the limit, but on CW, it was a compromise. But we used those 70 dB radios for signals within like 10 or 20 kilohertz of our where we were wanting to operate. So we don't, we don't stress our radios that much most of the time, but of course you get a de-expedition or like in the US with field day, boy, that's a different story. Right, okay. But how does, for example, how does um, an FT81, I know, I know I might be asking you about specific radios, and I don't want to harbour it anymore, but if you get an FT817, I've heard that the receive side of the 817, the little portable 5 watt radio, is equal to some of the very good quality uh, on receive, higher end Yesu radios you know and how does say the 817 compared to the Zygu I'm thinking of getting a Zygu just to go portable in the countryside and throwing up a wire aerial and knowing that I'm in the countryside with less noise uh, with less uh, less electrical noise uh, but you're, what you might be saying here, and what, uh, what's coming across is that if you do that, be aware that if you get in a, something like a Zygu, and there may be someone actually here now on our Zoom meeting that's got a Zygu, 
Um, and you might be saying, in a way, don't get one because you'll not be able to deal with strong signals, adjacent signals. Well, but, you know, if you're out there in the field, you know, doing summits on the air or just in a park, you yeah. don't have a five element beam at 70 feet. <laughs> so we are going to be stressing the radio as much with a limited antenna. And like I say, a lot of the time, a radio that's 40 dB less than the top on my chart worked okay. I mean, that's what we had. We had 70 dB radios for 20 or 25 years. So, I mean, you know, pick your poison. In other words, what are you going to be using it for? What's your budget? I mean, I happen to have a 705, the little ICOM 705 now, yeah. and it's actually going to show up in a chart in a little bit. And um, so it's just, um, we have a lot of choices out there. The, I would say you've, you've got the KX2, the KX3, the Lab 599. There's, I think, a, at least six, um, or if not eight, QRP portable rigs that run on batteries that um, are on my website, so you can compare them all. And the Zygu will be there in the, in the near future. Yo, Dick, do we, is that, Nick, is that the last of the questions right now? Uh, I'm not sure. Have we got, yeah, John, uh, JMB. John, you need to unmute. You're still, you're, you're on mute All right uh yeah a couple of simple things there one seems to me an awful lot of radios that i've encountered fall down on straightforward audio quality it's low five worse than a cheap transistor radio with a pokey little speaker that goes, ring, 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 ring. um and that doesn't seem to be addressed you know you find expensive rigs quoted power output at 10 percent i grew up with hi-fi not an audio fool uh, but um, one expects better. The other right. thing is the sheer operability of uh, equipments. As an occasional user, I don't use things all day, every day. I'm not that dedicated. I don't want to have to get the book of words out before I can work out how to drive the thing. I want to turn it on, set the frequency and volume, and away I go. Just a thought. Okay, well, two good cut topics there. Well, I've been harping on uh, audio quality for a long time. Matter of fact, when the K3 came out, the audio receive audio was terrible. And I was uh, complaining to uh, Ellicraft about it. And then finally I said, we're both gonna be at YCCC uh, convention in the, the fall. And I'm gonna be talking about how terrible the K3 audio is. And they went into the lab and spent the next three days and they made their first of several improvements. My uh, ICOM 781 had wonderful clean audio. So I have I talked to Bob Allison quite some years ago now and was complaining about this distortion at 10%, which is absolutely nuts. And that should just be eliminated. So I convinced him to measure the distortion at a more reasonable level. So he makes a publication in the, you know, in the review, he'll say, what's the distortion at one volt, one volt into a, eight ohm resistor and those are like you know one percent or something or 0.5 you'd hope so that is something that the oems have kind of ignored um, and there are most of the radios are running on 13 volts so you could produce a, um, a differential amplifier that would put out five or six or ten watts but it's really really rarely done so that is a sore point and i agree with that and what was the other Oh, operability, absolutely. I mean, people say, well, do I need to buy the top radio on my website? You got to look at the whole picture, whether it, it's ergonomic suits you or uh, whether it has the feature set. So you don't buy a radio on one number. And, and uh, personally, I don't want to run my radio with a Windows computer, but other people love it. So it's sort of what fits your style. Okay, thank yeah, you. Rob. In my uh, case, it's knobs and you, switches, but um, I'll, you know, I'm old fashioned, I think. All yours. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> okay, we'll continue on here for a bit. So there's basically two types of transceivers today, the super head, whether it's a hybrid or not, that's still a super head, and the direct sampling, as we just started to talk about. So this hybrid simply means that it has a direct sampling band scope, which has astounding resolution. And you can see some terrible signals with our band scope besides just looking for the next station to work in the contest or uh, try to figure out why all this splatter you're hearing and see how far up the band is. 
So they both have their strengths and weaknesses. If I was uh, on field day, where in the US we might have two or three stations on the same band, a CW station, an FT8 station, and a sideband station, I may have trouble with my direct sampling radio because it's gonna look at the whole band at least. So from a blocking standpoint, the super hit will have a 20 or 25 dB advantage from the standpoint of overload. So if we are on field day or a ham a mile away, I had a couple people send me emails in the last couple of months that said a ham moved in two blocks away and I'm gonna need a new radio. Well, that case, if the ham two blocks away is on the same band, you probably want a super hit. And here's the reason the front end LC filtering of a typical um, radio that covers not only the ham bands, but you know all the broad, broad all the short wave bands, there are, the, the, the uh, half octave filter is gonna cover a lot of the spectrum. So let's look at 20 meters. We've got uh, 7300 or a 7610. Now the 7610 has a tracking pre-selector that'll help, but it's gonna have 11 to 15 megahertz approximately coming into this direct sampling ADC chip. So there's a potential for non-ham signals, broadcast signals, data signals, who knows what, to uh, come in and overload the receiver. So there's a case where the direct sampling radio has really got to look at a lot of spectrum. Now, for the most part, we're talking about signals over S9 plus 60. So we, luckily we don't have to deal with S9 plus 60 or S9 plus 70 all that much. The tracking pre-selector that exists like in the 101D or the 7610, it's gonna take out of band signals down a bit, but not much effect in band. More so on 160 than 10, obviously, because the fractional bandwidth. So in some cases, the crystal roofing filter has a big advantage because it's gonna knock out 99% of the signals on the band, let alone out of the band. So what are we gonna to wanna to look at today? Well, if you're a CW operator, QSK, or at least click-free semi break-in. I usually run semi break-in. I like to hear between words, um, but I don't want a lot of clicks and ticks and pops. I do use an audio peak filter on CW in a contest. And we'll discuss that in a bit. I probably am not going to buy a radio that doesn't have a band scope and a waterfall today. They're so useful. Whether we're in a DX pileup or a contest, or we're just wondering what's that interference up the band, I can see it. And to bring up your same comment, what's the user interface like? How easy is it to use? Do I have to go into a menu or two and how many levels deep to make some simple change like power output? I know some of the easy radios, you don't have a dedicated knob to adjust the power to drive your linear. Of course, if you're barefoot, you just run it at full power, but you change bands or uh, uh, adjusting so your linear is not being overdriven, it's nice to have a knob. So uh, things like that. Of course, your logging program for DXing and uh, probably for your contesting too, uh, you want that to be rock solid and not to hang up on you. If I'm using a computer controlled radio, I want a knob. Now that's a personal choice. You can use the wheel on your mouse and you can click and do that type of thing, but I like a knob, old school. So let's look at these numbers that appear in the reviews on my website, what do they mean? And as I mentioned earlier, do you have to have the top radio? And I say you don't, thank goodness. And how do we optimize whatever we have? Because whatever it is, we like to make it work the best way possible. So de depending on which brand you have, all of them have at least one radio that's gonna be completely great. The close in diamond range of 95 dB or better. The reciprocal mixing, that phase noise, we'd like that better than the close in dynamic range because it only takes one strong signal nearby or maybe even not nearby to cause a problem. So we'd like that number to be bigger than the, than the dynamic range number. So the rigs with this kind of performance, the ICOM line, Flex, Apache, Elecraft K3S, the Kenwood 890S, 
the AZU 101D or MP, and now even the FTDX 10. That's on my website now. And I've got one in the other room. So all the major six OEMs, if you're brand specific and I've liked this brand forever, you can stay with it, no problem. Above six meters is a different story, but uh, up through six meters, we just, we're kind of in Nirvana land today. So here's the top 21. I increased it a little bit from 18 and 20 and 21 off my website, but this is not the first 21 starting at the top. This is the first 21 individual radios. You say, why is that? Well, for instance, the K3 came out in 2008, and then the K3S came out. The direct sampling radios, they have a bit more variation from unit to unit because the ADC chip is different. Every ADC chip is not the same. It has a little bit more or less distortion. So when you make a measurement in the laboratory, maybe you wouldn't notice it on the air, but there's gonna be some differences. So there's second samples of uh, several of the direct sampling radios. There was also one where I was comparing a Flex 6700 to a K3S on 10 meters where I set the preamp gain so that they had equal noise floor so you could really compare apples to apples. And that's up there. So this is the top 21 of the individual models. And look at it, right in the middle, we got 100 dB radios and we've got 110 dB radio at the top. But look down at the bottom, there's that little ICOM 705, which covers 160 meters through 70 centimeters. I've used it in three major contests, sweepstakes, ARRL 160 CW, this past December, the first weekend in December. I used it for the entire contest. I worked hundreds of stations. And then the ARRL 10 meter contest, CW and Sideman. So here's a little radio. If you can run an ICOM 703, you can run a 705. Now it's gonna do things on VHF and UHF satellites and D-Star and all sorts of stuff that I don't even fool with. But uh, so look at that amazing that you've got a radio that's two and a half pounds you can take out in the field and it's got just amazing numbers and you're gonna enjoy using it. So look at all those choices from the, all the brands are there and uh, you don't have to say, I've got to buy this newest thing out of the box. I've run 14 of this 21 in contests. And once the CQ Worldwide 160 contest in the end of this month, I will run the FTDX 10 in that contest. So I'll be able to say I've run it in 15 of the 21 and uh, enjoyed using all of them. <clears throat> N2IC is a contester that used to be in the Denver area that's now in New Mexico. He scores very high in contests and he has a pair of TS590s. You can get a 590S for probably $700, an, an, a used one, an SG probably for $900. And so he does SO2R with the two radios that are really quite modestly priced. It comes down to location, antennas, operator skill, and the radio in that order is sort of the way I look at it. You can't, you can't beat the, uh, the best antenna you can put up because that's really important. People keep, keep asking me, when am I gonna test the K4? Well, <laughs> when's it gonna ship? Hopefully this month. So I don't have any numbers yet because nobody knows, but we can make a guess because we know the architecture of the K4. <clears throat> It's gone, the basic K4 will have one ADC chip and one set of bandpass filters, LC filters in the front end. If you buy the K4D, that'll have two ADC chips and two sets of bandpass filters. And that's gonna be architecturally just like the IC7610. Two direct sampling, two receivers, totally independent. You put one in 160 and one in six meters. Now. With the K4, if you're gonna be on the same band, you can open up two receivers, but if you wanted to go run on 20 and listen on 15, you'd have to go broadband on the front end. So that would be the trade-off with the straight K4. Now the K4 HD, I have no idea when it's gonna come out, but it's gonna have a super HET module and crystal roofing filters 
like the K3. It's going to have one CW roofing filter and one sideband roofing filter per receiver for a total of four. Now, a K3, you could load it up if you had the second receiver with 10 roofing filters. I always thought that was overkill. And you can see it really was overkill because the K4HD will have four filters, period, one for each mode per receiver. Here's a price comparison of what's on the market today and uh, what we know about the K4 and the K4D. And really, we look at kind of a sweet spot for the middle tier radios. We know that sort of, you know, not the $12,000 7851, for instance, but for around $3,000, you can kind of get a flagship radio for a, a, a lot of features for the money. It's, it's interesting that the uh, K4 is going to be that much more expensive, but maybe they'll have a lot of features that we don't know about. So that'll be interesting when it finally comes out. I was kind of surprised how well the FT DX10 is on the performance. Now, this is just measurements of lab data as far as dynamic range and phase noise and all that stuff. It certainly doesn't have all the features of a 7610, for instance, or the 101D, but it's only $1,700 today. And you can imagine in a six months or a year, it'll be lower than that. So there's just astounding what we can buy now in a reasonable price range. And as I was mentioning earlier, I've run the ICOM 7300 in eight contests and had no complaints. No, it didn't have an audio peak filter. No, it didn't have solid state TR switching, had a planking relay, but it works. And it's a thousand bucks in the US. So we need to talk about net gain. So the following slides are gonna talk about Using common sense, when do we need a preamp? And I'll explain how to do that. And when should we use an attenuator and why we should do that? Like for instance, if we're on 40 meters at night, assuming we're using our transmit antenna, you should be using your attenuator. And if you've got the preamp on, that's just crazy. But that happens. I've talked to people and they say, I'm having trouble copying Hey, what's your noise level, S7? Well, I'm gonna turn my preamp on now, the noise level is S9, so that just doesn't work. <clears throat> so here's a screenshot from a TS890S in the contest I was running December of 2018 on 10 meters, a WRL contest. Now, of course, two years ago, we weren't even seeing the hint of a new sunspot cycle. So the signals were, week, but there we had over 20 stations in a 10 kilohertz swath of the band, as you can see there on the spectrum scope. And what was I doing, besides the fact I was having to work each of those at a time, I had the preamp on upper right hand corner, makes sense, I'm in a quiet location, and I'll talk about that in more detail later. How can I decide when to turn the preamp on? And then down at the right hand bottom, the audio peak filter which reduces noise. I don't run it real sharp, but it takes the edge off of noise. So here we were, plenty of stations to work even two years ago on 10 meters. The week, week before that was um, the 160 meter CW contest and even more stations, look at the QRM level. There were over 30 stations in 10 kilohertz. This happened to be an ICOM 7610. When I took the picture, it was mainly to say, okay, on the upper middle right, I've got the audio peak filter on again, the CW contest, but I've got the attenuator on in the left, 12 dB of attenuation. And why do I want to do that? Well, there's on 160 and 80, local signals can be really strong. And often on the low bands, you're running some sort of a top loaded vertical. So you could have signals that really are 60 over nine that are a few miles away. But beyond that, there's no reason to have the AGC running on band noise. So you tune in between stations. You don't want your earphones to be blasting noise at the same level of all those stations that you're working. So what you want to do, you can use the RF gain. I happen to use the attenuator. And in the case of the 7610, it can go in three dB steps. So we can go three, six, nine, 12, 15, 18, et cetera. Uh, so I can adjust that attenuation. So when I turn it on and I'm tuned in between stations, the band noise 
drop several dB. And I even ran a couple of contests where I ran it at 18 dB. And what that did was made the band noise almost a non-issue. And from a fatigue standpoint, I get tired hearing all this band noise. So whether you're running 12 dB in this case, and occasionally I'll have to turn the volume control up because the signal's weak enough that he's below the AGC threshold. But the other 95% of the time, all these signals you can see there are above AGC threshold. So band noise just is a lot less annoying. So consider using your attenuator to make things more pleasant. So just turn it up until you hear the band noise drop down a little bit, and that's a good place to start. But when I took this picture, I had no idea there was so much more information there. So look at the signal that says key clicks 5x. Look how wide that guy is. And then we look over at the right where it says clean. And that signal is maybe 3 dB weaker. So that's insignificant. But look on the band scope and the waterfall. That guy over there that says clean, look how narrow that is. The entire waterfall is just nice and narrow. The one on the left is terrible. And there's just no excuse for having that type of, um, of a wide signal. As a matter of fact, some of the contests the, from the ARRL and CQ Magazine are looking into possibly disqualifying people who just have terrible key clicks. You can also see on the left-hand side of the wide signal, a little tiny signal trying to peek through the key clicks. You can see that little blip sticking up to the left of the main signal, and you can see it on the waterfall too. And I would probably have trouble trying to work that guy. And if, there's, if the key clicks weren't there like the guy on the right, I wouldn't have any trouble working him at all. So look at what you can see with these direct sampling band scopes or direct sampling radios. You can really see what's going on in the band. The same thing is true on sideband. The solid state amplifiers in our rigs aren't that clean. And there's only one OEM right now, Apache, that offers something called pure signal. And that means pre-distortion. Pre-distortion is used in the cell phone industry, the TV industry. They have an easier job of it because they know what frequency they're on. They don't have to worry about 160 through six meters, but you can see the signal on the right. That was KA0, KA. His signal is just straight up and down. Now, he's a hi-fi sideband guy. I don't go for that. So I wouldn't be running 4.6 kilohertz bandwidth because most people can't even hear that. But I'd be running to, you know, 2.7 or something. But look, there's no wings or no fuzz on the side of that signal. But we look down the band 14 kilohertz and look at all the distortion products from that guy's signal. So it would be nice if we had more signals like the one on the right. Flex has talked about it for seven or eight years, hasn't come, come to fruition yet. Elecraft says the K4 will sometime have pre-distortion in their product. Don't expect it when they first start shipping because they just need to get the radio out the door. Here's another example of that. And I'm afraid I have to admit that the lower signal there on the waterfall, that's me with my Kenwood. And you can see now this is a pretty much local QSO. We're all within like 50 or 100 miles of each other on 75 meters. And so I'm probably 20 over nine, but look how wide I am compared to my friend who's a tiny bit weaker, but look his signal straight up and down. That was an Apache and mine was a typical radio with no pre-distortion. So if we could all be like the one on top, wouldn't that be nice? So how do we decide whether to turn our preamp on? So here's some data I'm using a, I have five element beams on six and five elements on 10. And what you're going to do is switch between a dummy load. You can use an open circuit, but better a dummy load and your antenna. And what you'd like to know is when you tune to a dead spot on the band, you know, in between signals and you switch between your dummy load and your antenna, the noise should go up. If it doesn't go up much, then you need a preamp. So for instance, I was on 10 meters and no preamp and the antenna noise gain was only 3 dB. That means that the receiver is contributing half the noise. 
But if I turned on preamp one, it went up almost 10 dB. In that case, the receiver is contributing almost none of the noise because the band noise is dominant. And there probably wasn't any reason to turn preamp two on. But if I then went to six meters in a quiet location out in the country, well, I haven't ever used a six meter rig, a rig that covers six meters where I didn't need a preamp. If I switch between the dummy load and the antenna, the noise only went up one dB. You could barely hear that. It got measured on the meter, but almost non-existent. And even preamp one only went up four and a half dB. So the radio was probably contributing a third of the noise opposed to half the noise at three dB. But if I turned on preamp two, Again, almost 10 dB, in which case the receiver noise would be almost insignificant. And if you are doing work on 10 meters, six, and certainly above that, consider getting some hard line. Who wants to lose the signal in the coax? So question time again, Nick. OK, thank you very much, Rob. Uh, who wants to uh, go first? Let's just get everyone up. Can I ask a question, please, Nick? Yes, go on, Richard, far away. Yeah, good evening, Rob, and thanks very much indeed. A super presentation. Uh, at home, I run the ICOM 7700, which, as you know, is a huge radio with a, a mass of buttons and switches. Uh, it's very easy to operate because you never have to go into the menu. When I'm out portable, I use a little TS480 SAT. Uh, and that's a simple radio. There's, there's no scope on it. There's nothing fancy. Everything's to hand on, on, on the tiny faceplate. And it's a super little radio when you're out portable in a quiet location. Yes, and your question? Or just a statement? It was, it was just an observation, the, the difference between you know, a big radio and a tiny radio that's very simple. Ergonomically, it's very easy to use. And, and it's, it's just a super little radio when you're out portable. Oh, absolutely. And uh, you, we really want to pick the best product for what we're doing. And uh, so, and mobile, I mean, certainly the 480 is a comp popular for mobile and um, you don't need a band scope mobile or probably even out in the field all that much. But uh, yes, there's, you know, we've got these amazing choices and, and don't think that we need that 88 dB radio for the, for the ICOM 705 in, in all cases. I mean, um, I have a 706 in my car. I ran a 7300 on field day. So just pick the radio that works for you at a given time. Yeah, okay. Okay, thank you, Richard. Uh, anyone else to a question at this point? To... Uh, Terry. Yes, yeah, go on far away. Is that to me, Terry? Yeah, go on, Terry. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Uh, thank you, Rob. Very interesting stuff. Uh, two questions, and I'll forget the second one, probably. Um, you mentioned about preamps and uh, how do you know you want one? Um, and I'm guessing here you're talking about the preamp in the radio as distinct from the preamp up by the aerial, uh, which uh, doesn't come in the box, of course. Uh, I would offer that uh, maybe they shouldn't be called preamps in radios. What's that? <laughs> well, certainly I think the preamp in the radio is adequate most of the time up through six meters. Now I have an ICOM 9700 for two meters, 70 centimeters, and I don't have an antenna for 23 centimeters, but I guess I could. And so in that case, I'd really rather have the preamp up to the top of the tower, but that can get expensive. We not only need a preamp that can switch, we need probably need a sequencer. So you can spend a thousand dollars trying to have a, a really nice preamp up on the top of the tower on two meters or 70 centimeters. But really on six meters, and particularly if you say, okay, I'm really doing weak signal work and now with six meters has kind of been taken over by FT8. And uh, so you can really work some weak stuff. I think the preamp and the radio is just fine, but I would say get rid of your RG8 and get some half inch hard line or seven eighths hard line. So I, I don't see much point in a mass mounted preamp on six, but absolutely. Here's my problem on two meters. Uh, 
if I point my antenna, which is four elements at 70 feet, so that means I've got 270 feet of hard line plus pigtails on each end. I point it towards the nearest city, which is Greeley, that's about 30 miles away. And the noise coming out of Greeley goes up on my uh, audio meter that I made that measurement four and a half dB. So in that case, uh, I'm probably okay working somebody in Greeley this week. But if I point it north to Cheyenne, I can hardly hear the antenna connect. It goes up like one half a dB. So I really need a mass mounted preamp if I was trying to do weak signal, worth, weak signal work to the directions that are not noisy. And that would be north. East is noisy on six meters for me. So it, de it depends. So it, preamps are fine on six meters and below in the radio, but you're right. It probably belongs up, up the tower in a lot of cases if you're into works, working weak signal stuff. Okay, thanks. Now I have remembered the second uh, point. Um, talking about putting attenuation in the uh, in the path, um, I have been castigated by some colleagues for putting attenuation in, uh, and they moan terribly when uh, they come to the radio that I've just vacated and find that I've put twelve or eighteen dBs in. Um, I would offer and uh, put me right please that you put enough attenuation in to get the band's noise down to s1 if it's more than s1 uh, i would suggest um uh, there's too much band noise and not enough attenuation yeah that's fine and uh, let me point out something band noise between 10 meters during the day and 160 at night the difference in band noise is over 30 dB, three zero. We've got sensitivity to burn because our radio works just fine on 10 meters. And um, so you're right. Now, the Apache radios and the Flex radios, they have a different way to adjust AGC threshold. In the Flex, it's called AGC hyphen T and adjust the threshold. And in the Apache, you have a horizontal line that you can slide around on your screen. It does the same type of thing that you can adjust the AGC threshold like with the attenuator. Well, the people that are complaining to you don't really get it because if you're on 160, you can run your 18 dB. I did a whole contest switching between a TS-990 with 18 dB and an ICOM 7300 with the 20 dB preamp. It's only got one or the other, none or 20. Of course, you've got an RF gain control. And I ran the whole contest. And that was the first time I'd ever run it at 18 dB or 20. I'd always run 12, but I loved it. And since then, I've been running it at 18 dB at night. Now, of course, as the JA start coming in at 7 o'clock in the morning and the sun's coming up, well, then, no, I don't have 18 dB. I probably don't run 18 dB on 40 meters, but I definitely run 12. Uh, so there's no reason for it to read up scale. And a lot of S meters, though, almost all of them, except the the direct sampling ones, which usually do it right, they're usually 3 dB per S unit. Even this new FDDX10, I just measured it this morning, 3 dB per S unit. So uh, the point at which it starts reading on the S meter may actually be different than how you want to make the adjustment by ear. So I just say, start tuning in your, turning on your attenuation until by ear, the band noise drops. Regardless of the S meter, that may be a good choice. And I you used to say that all the time, but then with the Apache and the Flex, well, the S meter works differently and uh, it's 6 dB per S unit, but you just want the band noise not be running the AGC. Absolutely. Hi, Hi uh, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hi, yes, Nick. Me. I wonder if I could ask Rob a question, Norman yes. Jacobs. Yes, Norman, go ahead. Mate. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Nick. Hi, Rob. Uh, thanks, Jeff. Yeah, stunning talk so far. I just wondered, um, not that I'm into contesting, with the advances in technology and these transceivers, do you, what's your opinion? Do you think uh, the man that pays the most money is going to win the competition? Um, it seems to be sort of very unfair now, particularly with, we won't get into remote stations, um, but uh, just with transceivers. Thank you. Well, if you go back to WRTC, World Radio Team Contest, or whatever it stands for, uh, one year it was in Russia, and the people that won it had a pair of uh, FT-1000 MPs. Now, the 1000 MP is not that 
an unusual radio. And of course, with WRTC, everybody had the same antenna in the same country. And they had operator skill differences and who knows what radio. Now, admittedly, K3LR and W3LPL, those installations are stratospheric from cost <laughs> and complication. Yeah. But um, the, the, top, the top money spender doesn't necessarily win. It, it also depends on your only competing, at least I look at it this way, I compete from zero land. I live in the middle of the country. I don't have the, the advantage of the guys on the East Coast working in Europe and G's and uh, J, you know, DL's and all that. And if I was in California, I wouldn't have as, I'd have a better chance of working a thousand uh, JAs. So I kind of look at how do I compare to people in zero land? And I've got wallpaper on the on wall where I managed to come in first in CQ Worldwide sideband from zero land. Now I've got good antennas, but I don't have 130 foot rotating towers with stacks. So um, it, it, as I mentioned earlier, location, I was in a location on weekends for seven years where my takeoff angle to JA was 40 degrees. I worked one JA in seven years. So location, antenna, operator skill, and then I'd say the radio. So I don't think the guy that spends a fortune necessarily comes out on top, but he may have an advantage. But, you know, we can also just say I had fun. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, a query, if I may. Yes, go uh, on, John. Yeah. One thing I've found is that uh, noise reduction, digital noise reduction, uh, makes a difference between operating and not operating. Yes, it does. And I think that's there's a wide variation in how effective that is. Um, the most effective noise mitigation I've ever used is on the Apache. And that noise reduction was written by the same person who wrote pure signal pre-distortion. His name is Warren Pratt, NR0V. And he now happens to live in Loveland, Colorado, you know, 40 miles from me, he used to live in California. And so if there is something up on my website, nc0b.com slash nr0v. And there's two audio clips that he presented at a tapper presentation at Dayton about three or four years ago, showing what's possible with noise mitigation. And it was just astounding. You could hardly believe it. So nc0b.com slash nr0v. You know, download the two clips or just play them up there on the website. Uh, there's quite a variation, um, and I don't happen to have a noisy environment, so I bought my place in the country because of that, but uh, my ICOMs do better than my Kenwood, and I don't have a handle yet on the FTDX10, for instance, but there's quite a variation, and a lot. Of, if you're in an urban environment, you may pick a radio simply the one that manages noise mitigation the best because that may be your biggest problem. When I talked to W0IVJ on in mornings, his noise level is 18 dB higher than mine on 75 meters, like at eight o'clock in the morning, 18 dB worse than mine. So that's noise mitigation is a big deal for him. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the radio I have here is a TS570, which is old. It's not due for replacement they cost money, uh, has sort of fairly crude selectable um, noise reduction, of which one position is okay for sideband. The next one on CW, which I never use, is uh, just removes everything. But you get a sort of um, background burble as a result of it, but it's still quieter. We're in a suburban location, okay. but I'm 100 foot from a multi-service radio mast, which doesn't help. And... Um, I do find it makes a significant difference there. Thanks, anyway. Well, you're right. I mean, I don't tend to turn my noise reduction way up. I'd say on sideband with an ICOM, I run one or two because then it starts sounding like a bad cell phone call. But on CW, I'll crank it up to three or four. So that comes down to your personal tolerance for noise reduction artifact. And some people, I think, uh, uh, Adam Farson, VA7OJ, he likes it turned way up. That's great. I don't turn it up that much. So that's just a personal choice. What, how much of the artifact bothers you? 
Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, I just have no choice of it's either there or it's not basically. Um, so well, I don't have no choice. well, the newer radios usually are adjustable. Yeah, but I, as I say, I have old radios. I'm not in the market for new ones. <laughs> okay. I think um, Phil, did you did you have a question, Phil? Yeah, just interesting because I've got a span of radios here. Um, I mean, I've been using the Flex 6600 for a couple of years, and yeah, it's a really great radio, and uh, it works well. And especially if you start to use all the facilities on it, with the ability to opt to monitor you know, more than one band and everything else, it's really good. Prior to that, I had the K3, which well, I've still got the K3 here, and it's it's hard to tell a lot of difference under most conditions. You know, what would you work on one that you wouldn't work on the other? But the real outstanding old one, which I put on from time to time, is a 75 S3C with the 200 hertz Collins filter in it. And that on 40 meters CW is still quite amazing. Back the RF game back, turn the thing on, and it's just quite amazing what you can still pick out with that old radio, which is effectively how old now? 60, 50, 60 years old? I don't find that shocking. And a matter of fact, one of my uh, uh, friends from Europe was a big 160 meter operator and he had a 10 tech Orion 2. And he hooked up his Sherwood modified R4C and made it the sub receiver on his Orion. And he said he could copy better with that pure analog radio on 160 with weak signals than with the Orion. Yeah, that's in fact that's the only one thing about the S line. Of course, it hasn't got 160, which is the annoying <laughs> thing. <laughs> right. Otherwise, yeah. I'd be using it. But it's uh, that old 200 hertz filter that Collins made is just quite an amazing filter. Yeah, that was a crystal filter. That was yeah. a great filter. Yeah. yeah. It almost acts like a Q multiplier, actually. I mean, the signals just tune across and they just pop out of, of nowhere, and you know, it's just just one signal at a time. Well, no DSP artifacts there. <laughs> right, we've got another question to Rob at this point. Yeah, go on, Ken. You'll need to unmute. Yeah, just, um, <clears throat> I know it's not about transceivers. It's actually about a device that is coupled in line. I use a time wave. I don't know if you've heard of those. You, you may have, Rob. Yes, it's I own one. Oh, Excellent. It's an ANC4. What do you think of those? Because I use that and it's incredible the amount of, well, I've got power line noise close to my house and it absolutely can wipe them out. Well, that's good. It works that well. I mean, we're, we're just really talking about you know, where do we do some sort of noise mitigation? Do we do it in DSP? Do we do it after mm. uh, at the at the audio level? I mean, whatever works, great. Uh, you know, I, I use that when I was using a 10 tech uh, Argonaut six or seven, seven, whatever the last one was, it couldn't drive a speaker. <laughs> so I could drive headphones. So I, I was using that time wave to uh, drive the speaker. So uh, I know what you're talking about. Okay, thank you, yeah. Okay, thank you, Ken. Okay, uh, Rob, back to you, I think. Okay, all right. So now we're gonna talk about some uh, details on transmitters and why I'm sort of jumping up and down saying we got to have better transmitters of our transceiver of course. This is the cleanest transmitter I've ever owned. I think it's out of production and maybe it matches with that 75 S3C. Um, when we measure distortion products and you see the graphs in the RSGB or QST, when we use a spectrum analyzer, it's pretty simple. We put one cursor on one of the two equal tones, and we put the other cursor on whichever intermodulation product we're trying to measure, third, fifth, seventh, ninth. In this case, it's measuring the third order of this Collins 32S3, and it's 36.5 dB down, as you can see in the green there in the upper right-hand corner. Now, unfortunately, for whatever reason, some decades ago, the magazines and the advertisers decided we need bigger numbers. So we're going to measure stuff against PEP, and we're going to add 6 dB to whatever number we measure on the spectrum analyzer. Of course, that didn't make the radio any better, but that's what we've got. So 
if we measure this Collins at 36.5, that's really 42.5, which is just amazing. The other thing that's even more important is how quickly those distortion products fade away. This spectrum analyzer picture, plus or minus 20 kilohertz. So in this case with the Collins, at plus or minus 10, I mean, we're like down 80 dB. So there's just not much of anything after plus or minus 10. So this is the best transmitter from the standpoint of being clean that I've ever owned. Here's the second cleanest, and that was a Kenwood TS990S with a 50 volt PA. Now, interestingly, the third order was only two and a half dB worse, and that's not much, but look how much how much further out the distortion products go. So instead of being gone at plus or minus 10, it's pretty much down 80 dB, 80 dB, 80 at about eh, plus or minus 18. So that's better. And by the way, that the 990S was very consistent band to band and very consistent at different power levels, whether it was 180 watts, 100 watts or 50 watts to drive a linear. Now it did degrade a, degrade a bit at 200 watts, but I never ran it at 200 watts. Well, there's a K3. And in this case, it's about what, nine and a half dB worse than the Collins on third order. It's only 27, not 36.5. But look at the other difference at plus or minus 20, it's still going and it hasn't fallen off, certainly like the Collins or even like the TS990S. So this shows the reason that back to receiver performance, I mean, all we had for 20 or 25 years was the up conversion radios. I think the first one might've been the TR4 from Drake. No, 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 the TR7 from Drake. And the last one I owned was the Pro3 from Icon. But they all had dynamic range close in of about 70 dB, maybe, 75, maybe 65, but mostly around 70. Well, here we've got a TS590S that has a dynamic range close in of 92 dB. But here we are, let's say we're four KCs away from this signal that's calling CQ contest, CQ contest, never ending. And we're trying to work a weak guy four or five kilohertz away. And the distortion products are down 45, 50 dB. Well, the dynamic range of the radio is over 90. So we can see why we lived with these radios on sideband because it didn't really matter. The, the splattering guy that was three, four, five, six kilohertz away was still dominant by his transmitted signal as opposed to the dynamic range of the radio. CW, a different story as we'll see. So that's why we really, that's what we bought for 20 plus years. And that's what was for sale. So how does the CW signal bandwidth compare? <clears throat> now, we should also monitor our amplifier. Back when I was living here in the 70s, I didn't have anything sophisticated. I hadn't even started testing radios and I just ran my amplifier how I thought it should run, but who knows what I was doing. I now monitor myself with a scope all the time, whether I'm in Denver or at my contest station and I use a sampler so that I can really see that I'm not overdriving my amp. So how close can we work on CW just like the limitation on sideband? So here's the deal. <clears throat> Key clicks are a big deal and we can adjust those in most of the modern radios and the manufacturers give us the option of having terrible key clicks right with a menu adjustment. And this is ridiculous. So this is the bandwidth of the TS890S sending dits at 30 words a minute with the, the range of rise time that's adjustable in the menu. So the top one that's really wide and awful set at one millisecond. The bottom one is at six and it's 25 dB less key clicks at one kilohertz offset. So if that guy we saw a while ago that had the broad key clicks, if he'd been adjusting his radio, assuming it was an, one that you could go into the menu, he should have set it at six, maybe even eight, if it would do that. And uh, so that he didn't look like he was covering up people, you know, plus or minus one or two kilohertz. So this was just shocking that uh, we can even 
allowed to do that. Now, one thing about Elecraft, they won't let you do that. It's fixed. It's 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 a set in hardware and software, and you can't uh, turn on terrible key clicks with a K3 just for instance. But almost everybody else, you can be a bad neighbor. It should really flash up on the screen when you pick one or two milliseconds. It says, you just turned on terrible key clicks, but I haven't yet seen that happen. Transmit composite noise. This doesn't get much press. It probably doesn't bother most of us a lot of the time. It really depends on what someone's signal that's close by or line of sight. And so here's three different rigs that demonstrate the effect of transmit composite noise. Now, composite noise means AM noise and phase noise. And they may, one or the other may dominate. In the case of the 7300 at wide spacing, the AM noise dominates over the phase noise. So anyway, the K3S, wow, it's kind of the top leader. It's really good at 10 kilohertz offset. And 100 kilohertz, it doesn't get much better because it's so good to start with. The ICOM 7610, well, it's obviously not as good at 10, but it's almost identical to 100. So if you were on field day here in the US and you were on CW or sideband, well, by the time you're 100 KCs apart, you're not going to be bothering each other. But then we look at the Yaesu FTDX 3000. Well, it's even worse at 10, but it doesn't get any better at all. So that's going to be a bad choice when you've got a situation with uh, a strong signal that uh, can be a mile away. It might be more. An example of one that's in Boulder, Colorado, there's a ham up in the foothills. So he's overlooking the entire city. So he's probably a thousand feet above the city. And he used to run an FT 1000 MP and he never bothered anybody, particularly 15 meters where another station uh, really likes to operate for DX. But he then bought an FTDX 3000 and all of a sudden his transmitted composite noise was putting S9 noise, S9 noise over like 100 kilohertz of the band. And so one of my friends went up there and measured his radio just to be prove that this was really the case. And uh, so this is something that hasn't had much press, hasn't had much emphasis. But Yezu finally got their act together with the 101D and the 101MP. I will be measuring the FTDX10 this weekend. I know the re phase noise is good on receive, but I haven't measured the transmit. But at least now you can buy a Yezu radio that's not going to be like the FTDX10. I don't know if you uh, in the Europe read the UK and, and the in your read my uh, QST article in November of 2019. Uh, I can send you a PDF if you haven't had a chance to see it. And I, the title that the ARRL put on it was, it's time to clean up our transmitters. And I really commend the league for publishing it because it kind of was squawking at their advertisers in a way. It talks about the type of interference that comes from our transmitters, whether it's the splatter, the key clicks or the transmitted broadband noise. In the same issue, it was interesting. They tested an expert 1.5K FA solid state amplifier, and they tested it the normal way. And this is with the PEP method, minus 30 dB. And um, if we were using the spectrum analyzer, it'd be minus 24. And then we put on pure signal. And that's that pre-distortion that's in the currently just in the Apache, but maybe someday from Flex and maybe we're promised someday from Elecraft. It improved the distortion products for the third order by 17 dB. And so that was great to see uh, them uh, emphasizing that. Solid state linear amps, and I'm using the term linear somewhat loosely. The league published a compendium of tube type amps in 1997. And every one of those amps had the third order products down 40 to 50 dB PEP. So we're stuck with the PEP silliness, but we're going to compare everything now PEP. Well, the uh, QST reviewed the Elecraft KPA 1500 and the distortion was minus 30, which is 10 or 20 dB worse than tube amps. The uh, Power Genius has been measured here in Colorado at minus 30. 
the league just tested it. They came up with minus 36, so not sure why that is. But um, so it's still in the 30s. And then this expert that I just mentioned, that came in at minus 30. Well, look at that TS990S. Well, its distortion was down 40 dB. So if you ran it through a solid state amp, it got worse by about 10 dB. But if you ran it through a decent tube amp, uh, it wouldn't get worse. So that's the that's, that's sad state of affairs. Now, one thing you should know that with pre-distortion, whenever that becomes more generally available or currently available with the Apache, you can put a sampler on the output of your amplifier and include your linear amplifier in that correction loop. And matter of fact, most of the new solid state amps on the market today have a sampler built in. So you can run that into your rig once it becomes more popular beyond just the one brand. The league just started publishing input output curves. Now this is a good way to kind of look at an amplifier and see what it's doing. So the one on the left here, it's in blue for 20 meters in this case. And you can see the input output curve is pretty straight up to about a kilowatt. And then slightly curves to the right, curves down up to 1500 watts. So I might run my KPA 1500 at a kilowatt instead of 1500. Then they published in July, the ACOM 1200S. That's a solid state amp. And in this case, the 20 meter one's red for some reason. And you can see it's pretty straight line up through 700 watts, but then it really goes to heck and it flattens off. So I would never run this at over half power. They did publish the numbers. So this should be a red flag when the third order and the fifth order are virtually identical. Just ignore that measurement, you know, something's wrong because it's uh, the third order is just an anomalous value. But they also published the distortion products at half power, 500 watts. So then things started making sense. The third order was down minus 33. So that's good in comparison to of the other solid state amps and it was down 41 for fifth order. So you really have to look at the details to see um, how your amplifier is going to compare. And then if we look those three that we had numbers on, you know, they were minus 30 or 31 third order and they were significantly better at fifth, which is what we expect. But when you see minus 34 and minus 33 for third and fifth order, you know that amplifier is not going to be clean on the air. So what's the bottom line today? The receiver performance from all six major manufacturers are excellent. You can pick whatever brand you like, you can pick a decent radio. Good radio, great radio. In a pileup today, the limit may be the other guy's noise. And what do I mean by noise? It can be splatter noise on sideband, key click noise on CW or broadband composite noise on uh, some of the radios that just are not very clean. So the receiver, you know, we'd like the best receiver that we choose to buy, but sometimes we can't copy that guy just because the other guy is splattering, making key clicks, or he's got composite noise covering things up. There's the last slide. If you do want a PDF of this and, and certainly provide it to the club, uh, Contest University has a lot of videos, much more than what I do. There's like more than a dozen professors that give talks on everything from tower safety to what's a band scope do or how to use a waterfall to how to uh, adjust your receiver um, Windows computer so it works best with your computer, etc. There's also some shootouts where I'll give a sort of chain, a train of consciousness comparison of running a couple of rigs in a contest, like the 7300 versus the 990 or whatever it was. And some of these get published by DJ0IP. So if you do a, a search on DJ0IP and Sherwood shootouts, you can come up with some interesting things to read. So there you have it. That's the end of the presentation and back to you, Nick. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much, Rob. That was a really interesting contribution there. Um, right, before we lose um, Rob, had anyone got any more questions to, uh, to Rob? I just um i i've got one nick yes go on far away russell um the transmit composite noise that you were talking about rob what what causes that is that 
all the same things that cause noise and receive, or is it something different? Well, it's more than one thing because if we know the receiver's phase noise, that should translate over to the transmitter's transmitted phase noise. But we also have AM noise. You, most of the time you would kind of assume that's minimal, but then if you look at some of the QST reviews, they'll show that transmit noise at 100 watts, if it's a 100 watt rig, and then at like 30 or 35 watts, which a lot of our amplifiers only need 30 or 35 watts of, no of drive. And in almost every case, the noise goes up. So that's in effect, you've, you're turning down the output, but the in that case, the AM noise doesn't change. So it gets worse, sometimes six or 10 dB. In one of the graphs in that QST article from November 2019 that I wrote, there is a, a spectrum analyzer, well, a phase noise and AM noise piece of test equipment from Roden Schwartz. It was measuring several different rigs and I quoted the 7300 at 30 watts. And it was amazing that at some offsets, the AM noise was like 18 dB worse than the phase noise. Wow. So, so we have the issues of reduced, when we reduce the output of our rig, the signal to noise probably gets worse. And sometimes the AM noise, and is it just noise in the IPA stage? I don't know, I don't know where it is, but uh, in some cases the difference is minimal, in other cases it's significant. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Russell. Frank, you got your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, thanks, Nick. And hi, hi Rob. Um, I, I have a, a gesture that involves a finger that will summarize my opinion of Rob's talk. And it's the Golden Thumbs Up Award. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I probably had you going. I'm probably winding you up there for just a second. This is a... <laughs> Awesome uncle award I just got from a, a great, a great niece. But uh, let me just say, Rob, Rob is a, in my view, an international treasure for what he spent. Gosh, Rob, what is it, uh, fifty years now uh, doing for amateur radio, and I, I defer to him on any and all things measurement. And Rob, Rob has just contributed uh, things to, to amateur radio that. Um, uh, you know, it's it, it was hard to imagine when he began tinkering with that Drake R4 uh, rig. Well, that was I 44. To, that I'm was sorry, 40. Ahead. Yeah, that was 44 years ago. And the only reason I started testing radios was because my radio played poorly, but the review said it was great. And that was just a fluke. And, and that that's the that's the inquiry of, of a true scientist. And if you look on either EHAM or QRZ today, you'll see one of Rob's filters that he built and used to sell uh, labeled as the best selective filter in the world. Now, that wasn't just a sales pitch that the guy's using today. I, I think most people uh, sort of said that. So let me just say, I, I enjoyed it greatly. And it's good to see some similar faces uh, here today. And I'll give you a little tease, Nick, with your permission for, for my talk. Uh, I don't overlap with Rob very much uh, because I don't have the technical capability. I'm a, a statistician. And what I've done is, is in communicating with Rob and learning about his measurements, I've taken his measurement data and simply asked the question, okay, what was the price of each rig in his table when introduced to the market? Because economists would say that's the signal to the marketplace, just like a new automobile that comes out. Oh, what are they going to get for that? We know you can haggle a price and over time it'll change. And as Rob used the example of the new FPDX 10, it's, you know, whatever it is today and in a year it'll be significantly, significantly less. And then I said, you know, let me listen to hams and the only consistent consumer satisfaction rating that we have that I'm aware of that's consistent is the eham rating. And so I took those data and I've, I've put them together and I looked at several ideas and I, I think Rob uh, would agree with me. I take one of 
one of his data points and I look at it over time and he's correct. We're in a period of time where the quality of the receiver as measured by Rob Sherwood is a couple of standard deviation. I mean, it's, it's off the charts relative to say the eighties and that occurred in 2000, but about 2010. So I'll tease you with that. You're going to see some trends there. And I put the bang for the buck into it, the performance relative to what you're paying. And you saw Rob give you some technical rankings from his bench of here are the top, I think 21 or something like that, Rob. And what I'm going to do is slice and dice some of those to say performance per dollar, you know, kind of a ratio and look at what we do in the business world of that upper quadrant. Do you get a lot of bang for the buck up here in this upper right quadrant? And I'll show you what some of those rigs are. And then we'll look at, at satisfaction. And you'll find that the flex rigs, which I've owned for years and own a 6,400 today, um, they don't, as, as, as you, um, you blokes across the pond, your homeboys, the Rolling Stones said, um, you, you don't get any satisfaction. Well, the flex rigs don't get quite the satisfaction level that the knob radios do. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that, but I don't really overlap with Rob. I kind of build, as they say, standing on the shoulders of giants. Rob is a giant to me, and I'm, I'm uh, pleased to kind of benefit from his work. So I'll ring off with that. <laughs> You had me worried for a moment when you were talking about what are you going <laughs> to point at me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. It, it, it's thank a you, thumb. Frank. It's a thumb. Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Frank. And thanks for that teaser for your contribution in a couple of weeks time. And, and incidentally, two weeks after your talk, so three weeks, uh, you know, the, the third uh, talk after Rob's, uh, we've got a guy in the UK who's going to talk about using old radios. So these are old valve radios uh, that um, he's going to he's going to talk us through as well. So we're, we're starting at one end and we're, we're ending up at the other end. But, um, you know, it's all it's all interesting, isn't it? And I I did note, Rob, your contribution in the meeting there to um, sometimes the delight in using an analog radio um, and the difference it makes. And uh, we've got guys clearly in the club here who are still using, you know, kits that's been around a long time. Well, it was hard for me to give up my ICOM 781s, which I purchased secondhand because back when they came out, I couldn't have afforded it. But that was a pure analog radio, but eventually it became 30 year old analog radio. And so they, they found new homes, but you know, an, an analog radio still has some, some pluses, no question about it. Most definitely. Right. Anyone else got a question? Yeah, Lynn, W0LEN. Yeah, uh, Nick, thank you so much. I just wanted to say thanks to uh, the Denby Gale, Dale group for, for having Rob on here today. I, um, I, I've traveled halfway around the world just to hear his wisdom again. And uh, uh, it's it's seldom that I pass up a discussion group if I see him on there because I know this this guy has really done his homework on uh, virtually everything. So thank you so much, and thank you for uh, making it available to uh, all of us who uh, are otherwise underprivileged by not being in your beautiful country. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Lynn. Uh, and and. Uh... Right, anyone else got a question to, to Rob before we call it an evening? A quick one. Yes, go on, far away. Yeah, go on, John. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for a splendid talk, uh, Rob. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, some more question on measurements. It seems to me, I used to be involved with uh, radio design, but it was FM and digital uh, pager type stuff mostly. Um, but what's missing from the measurement is uh, receiver distortion measured from a good signal coming in to the actual distortion at the output. So that includes all the signal processing, not just the audio output, but uh, detector, however that's done, uh, the whole works. Um, we're talking about filthy transmitter signals. I'm, we're, I'm in rich of it, Italy, so I know all about those. Um, but uh, 
you know, a measure of what's actually produced by the receiver, other than just the audio amplifier in it, would be quite useful. <clears throat> Years ago, well, for 25 years, I wrote for a book called Passport to World Band Radio. And we did always measure AM distortion and sideband distortion and published that in figures. And hopefully the numbers were 1% or something like that. So this is true, but it's even more complicated than that. If we make a static measurement on, uh, let's just say a, we put in a single tone, we're in sideband mm -hmm. mode and we measure the harmonic or intermodulation distortion, which by the way, was terrible for the K3 in 2008. That's why I sent the spectrum analyzer plots to Dwayne and they started plugging away at it. But also we have dynamic issues. And some of the radios, for instance, I used my Pro 3 once on, in a CW contest and never again, because under AGC attack, the distortion products were horrible because the, the product detector was being overloaded dynamically. The same was true of the R4C. So I replaced the product detector in the R4C. So it would be not only nice to have static data, a single tone or you know, two-tone test and look at the, uh, dis the uh, distortion products with a two-tone test, but also how to capture that dynamically. So I used an FFT analyzer, an HP 3651, and uh, 61, 30, wait, 35, 61. And I was able to single shot capture a dit and look at the third, fifth, and seventh, ninth harmonics dynamically versus steady state. And it was drastically worse. So it's a complicated thing to measure, but it, it's really there. And your ears will tell you right away if you're if you're attuned to listening to distortion. So it is, it's another fatigue factor. You know, when we're on the air for 20 hours in a contest, all that adds up and makes you tired. Yeah, thank you. As I say, it's not easy to measure, not easy at all, but that's the sort of useful measurement um, that is more the perceived effect of things perhaps that would be helpful. But thank you very much indeed, once again. Sure. Okay, thank you. Have we got any final questions to Rob before we... Yeah, Darren. Yes, good evening, uh, Rob, and thank you for um, a very interesting uh, talk. A very simple question, really. You've got all the data there. You've had all the rigs uh, to play with. What's your go-to radio at the moment? Well, the ones I own, uh, it, it typically set up in my shack, are a pair of IC7610s and a TS890S. The 890S is broken at the moment, so it's over at N0 QOs to get fixed. And uh, this weekend, I'll hook up the uh, FTDX10. I don't expect to own that long term, but I want to run it in a contest. So I'll run it at the contest at the end of the month, ARRL160CW. Uh, I, personally, being a 73 year old, I'm a knob radio guy, so I don't choose to run the Flex or the Apache. The Apache has some amazing features, such as the noise mitigation and the pure signal, but I'm old, old school. So that's where I happen to be at the moment. As I mentioned before, the for 15 years, I was running the ICOM 7781. Uh, I had two of them for because I have a multi-operation shack. So that's where I am at the moment. Yeah, okay, thank you, just interested. Okay, thank you, Darren. Right, uh, no more customers? Um, yeah, Richard, MRBG. Yeah. yeah, thanks again, Rob. Super presentation. They, you keep mentioning the 890, and it's one of the more expensive radios, uh, or one of the more expensive 100 watt radios. Does it warrant that extra price, do you think? <laughs> the reason I bought it, because I tested it first, and Kenwood does a really good job. They let me go to Ham Radio Outlet in Denver and pick a random box off the shelf, test it, and then send it back to them. And the reason I bought it was because the way the waterfall worked for contesting. My ICOM, for instance, and I'm think, and the ASU is the same, because I run a very narrow span, as you saw in those pictures, I look at plus or minus five kilohertz or maybe plus or minus less. And when I tune, most of the 
band scopes and the waterfall skew off to the side at an angle and I lose the signal. But the 890S is really clever if that when I tune it, it just shifts the waterfall and the spectrum display. And when I start to tune, it highlights the bandwidth of my DSP filter. So let's say I've got a row of 30 signals there in 10 kilohertz and I start on the bottom. I center it on the waterfall. I call him, he comes back, I work him. The next one I center it, maybe I already worked him. I go to the next one. So it wasn't so much that it, it had had uh, uh, enormous number difference from like the ICOM just for instance, but it had that feature for me for the way I contest, it was just invaluable. So I missed that. I can also run lots of averaging on the display, both the waterfall and the uh, spectrum scope, and it doesn't then lose the signal when I tune it. But when I have my ICOM using it, and I'll go back and forth, I have to turn averaging off because when I tune it, the little weak signals go away for three or four seconds. Now, the ICOM in, at my QTH, because I don't have a lot of noise, has better noise reduction and noise blanking than the Kenwood, but at the same time, from efficiency, since I don't run on CW, I'm not that good. I am an SNP operator, but I can work stations like one every 20 seconds for the first couple of passes through the bands. So, so I bought it for the band scope in that case. All right, thank you. Oh, thank Can you I have Richard? a question, Nick? Yes, yes, question, Jeff. Nick? Yeah, you're next, Jeff. Okay. Uh, good evening, Rob, and, and thank you very much for making a difficult issue understandable <laughs> to us. Um, um, one question about, about ICOM radios. The IP plus function, how useful is that? And when, sh when should you put it on or off? What is the use of it in, in practice? In practice, no one has ever said to me, and I've asked the question here in the States, in the UK, and, and when we had people in from the continent, no one yet has said they can tell a difference. Okay. It makes me a difference. Either. <laughs> yeah. Me either, that's why I'm asking. <laughs> right, in the lab it does. So yeah. one could assume it might have a statistical difference. Yeah. But the radios with the IP plus off are, let's say, about 80. And with it on, they're about 90, let's say, or whatever the number is. But you remember that most of the time on sideband, that the splatter guy is the limit. And on CW, it might be the key click. So uh, it will be interesting to see once we get four or five more years into the sunspot cycle on 10 meters when, you know, contesting uh, solar max seven years ago or whatever it was, I mean, 10 meters was astounding. There would be mm -hmm. signals from 28.3 to 29.0 or 29.1. I mean, just hundreds of them. And so would we, could we tell a difference punching IP plus on and off? Don't know. Would, yeah. But the other thing is, it does slightly raise the noise floor, and uh, but only a couple of dB or something. So that isn't very significant. So it linearizes the AGC, the ADC. Flex does it differently. They have a, a signal that a strong signal that's out of pass band, out of the even out of the band scope, that's driving the ADC chip hard to, to linearize it. The the ICOMs and the Flex. I mean, say the IKEA, ICOM and the Apache, they have a chip that has dither built in. IP plus is dither. Now, except for the 9700, it has an IP plus function that doesn't do anything. The chip doesn't have dither. Who knows okay. what they're doing, but it's useless. But whether it really matters, I don't think it does much until someone tells me different. But uh, so that's, for instance, if you would say, well, what's the difference between a 7300 and a 705. The 705 has no dither, has no IP plus. The 7300 with it turned off, they play about the same. Okay. It's It may be more advertising. I wish they hadn't called it IP something. That implies the uh, IP3, which doesn't apply to a digital radio at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, they should have called it linearization button, not IP plus, but they called it that, so whatever. And in RTTY, would that make any difference in RTTY? In Telex, in RTTY, or in digital modes, and in, in FT8 or, or GS8 call, or would that be any difference in, in, in these modes? 
because you don't have this... probably the, the problem with clicks and, and, and things like that. And... Right. Well, since, since we know that it does help as we get stronger signals that approach overload, it makes a difference. But whether it makes a real difference, you haven't seen it, I haven't seen it, I don't no. happen to work ready, but uh, uh, I think the, the, uh, the question is open yet. We don't know, but uh, it's not major. Okay, thank you, Rob. <laughs> okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, Terry, I think you're going to be the last one, Terry, with a question. So, yeah, go on, far away. Okay, thanks. Uh, Rob, you mentioned that you have a scope, uh, which you always have on when you are transmitting. You had a tectonic yes. scope. Um, that, that, is that purely a scope, or does it have a spectrum uh, display on it, uh, which um, I would think was also quite a useful thing to have if you want to bat off the uh, your splattering brigade? <laughs> it's just a scope. They happen to be tectronic. Some are tube and some are LCD, solid state, um, with a sampler, and it it's on the output of whichever. You know, I have three operating positions, and then all sorts of antennas, like 15 or whatever crazy number of antennas I've got. So at the output of all that, I have a sampler. So I just want to watch on sideband that, you know, I tune it up so uh, to legal limit and I'll set the scope for, let's say 6.2 division. So it's just over six divisions. And then when I go to sideband, I don't want it to ever go past six. So that's what I happen to do. Now, one thing that is misleading when we look at our transmit signals on our modern transmitters that have the spectrum display it shows our signal is just wonderful it's like straight up and down but that is not what's coming out the pa that's what's being generated in the dsp and the uh, the uh, all the electronics creating our signal so i do occasionally look at my signal I have an ICOM R8600, so it's DC to light radio. So I can tune it in on 70 centimeters or 160 or whatever and put it on max hold and I can transmit and watch myself. And unfortunately, it's discouraging because as you saw there, except for a rig with pre-distortion, we're not as clean as we'd like. So sometimes I watch myself that way, but that's hard to do. So I just watch a standard old oscilloscope and uh, be sure I don't flat top my linear. That's the big thing is, I mean, the linear takes 40, 50, 60 watts of drive. So we're not flat topping the rig. So I just don't want to splatter my amplifier. Okay, that's interesting. Um, have you uh, ever considered having something like an RTL dongle uh, just sitting there uh, driving a display which picks up the RF floating around the area. Or well, that, would, RF, that is. Yeah, that would accomplish the same thing I did with the other receiver. So, yeah. uh, I mean, once you sort of do it once, you see like, oh, well, it is what it is. And But I think the standard scope catches the mistake. I mean, I switched antennas. If they didn't tune the same, I, I one time got yelled out on 10 meters that I was splattering. Maybe it was 15 meters, one of the two. And I'd switched antennas, and I hadn't paid attention, and I was flat topping. But uh, so that case, the I looked up at the scope, which I wasn't looking at, and uh oh. So I think the scope will do just fine if you're trying to catch a mistake uh, that you switched something and you didn't readjust. Okay. Thank you very much for an absolutely excellent evening. Well done. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, can we show our appreciation to, to Rob for his contribution tonight? It's extremely good. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Yep. Great. Yeah, thank oh. you. Th thank you very much indeed, Rob. I'll give you the final word and then uh, I'll just do a few bits. I'm going to show my ignorance here. We had a call up there, 2E0, and I'm not familiar with that. Where's that? Uh, that, that's also from the UK, uh, from England, uh, and it's it's our intermediate license. So we've got three levels of license in the UK, foundation, intermediate, and full. And the intermediate um, have, have got pretty good um, scope, I think a maximum of 50 watts on the intermediate license. Um, and uh, that's what the 2E0 is. And then an M and M zero, for instance, is what? M M zero is also the UK. That's one of our more recent uh, call signs uh, for those that are holding a full license. Oh, okay. All right, very good. Well, 
I, I appreciate the invitation. Hope everyone enjoyed it. And uh, we'll turn your, uh, your club back to you. See you later, Nick. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Rob. That was a really good um, contribution. And before you go, uh, one of our newer members in the club uh, sent me a message uh, while you were talking saying he was really enjoying it. He was struggling to understand everything. He said, but I'm still learning. And I just sent him a message back to say, look, you know, I've been playing with radio for 50 years and I know I'm still learning. And I think the day we, we stop learning is the day uh, something has gone wrong. Um, so, you know, there's always something new to learn in this hobby and from other people as well, uh, both from reading and, uh, and listening to them. And I, I've made a note, uh, Rob, I, I'm an ARL member. I'll, uh, I'll dig out your QST um, article of November 2019 and um, uh, send that round to people as well. That would be, uh, I'm sure, of interest uh, to lots of people. I can send you the PDF if you want. Yeah, that would that would save me a job, wouldn't it? Otherwise, I can I've got to construct the PDF from the uh, from the digital version of it. So if you if you wouldn't mind, Rob, that would be really I'll send that round and make it available to uh, to club members. So Thank I'll send I'll send this talk as a PDF also, and right. uh, I mean the slides, yeah. and then you've got the audio. And um, I mean, right. several people have said, you know, I listened to your some of these end up on you know youtube or whatever however they're published mm -hmm. and then some have said you know i listened to that two or three times and i got a little bit more each time so mm -hmm. uh, it's so much nice i mean like all those things on contest university all those videos are there you can go play them over and over it's just a wonderful uh, resources we have today it, it, indeed so and we've since we started our online meetings um at the beginning of last year uh, we've put them all on YouTube. So we've set up a Denbydale Radio Club YouTube channel um, and we've now got a fantastic range of, of videos on so many different aspects of the hobby, which is great. Uh, but as you say, Rob, there's so much of it around nowadays. It's astonishing. All right. Good evening. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheers. Nice to see you. Thank hey, you. Bye -bye. Good night. Bye-bye.